Celtics Reddit podcast. I'm not actually your host. I'm just some guy in New Zealand <laughs> talking to two guys in Australia about the Celtics. We've got our Newcastle correspondent, Jackson. Jackson, how are you? Miserable. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to ham it up a little bit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm, I'm actually alright. <laughs> you had a good Clearly. day at work, you know. So. Yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> well, uh, Ben, how I are you I was going to say, mate? if you want to ask, I'm I'm doing fine as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not that bad, but uh, it's so so bad. In fact, that we're completely changing it up here. Joe is hosting. I'm I'm a guest. Uh, a mere co-host, <laughs> and uh, but we're going to try and have some fun with this uh, this recent Celtics disaster. We can certainly try. <laughs> yeah, so boys, um, I'm actually fully flicking into host mode here. This will be a this will be a wild ride. <laughs> ben, you're such an accomplished podcast host. I'm feeling a little dirty about doing this. No, this is good. Right this is what you, the but... season so far calls for. So uh, let's let's let's. We need to this. mix it up. <laughs> We need to change something. Mm. We need to change That's something. A metaphor. Um, a simile, maybe. So, so, Ben, at what point did you emotionally tap out of this game? Of this particular game? Second quarter, yeah, yeah. Uh, 39-23 in favor of the Clippers. And I think I messaged you guys in our Slack at that point being like, I don't think that the team can come back at this point. It just seemed like morally and... Um, uh, basketball wise it didn't seem possible at that particular point and then they gave us the old almost comeback we're going to come back we're going to inspire hope which as we all know as Wayne Spoonie has preached is part of the Dennis system uh, but inspire hope but not actually execute on that and, and come back at all so second quarter for me was the the moment where I, I knew that it was was over what about you, Jackson? Now, this I feel like, well, just hang on a Sorry, second, I'm, Ben. I'm, I'm running the podcast. <laughs> yeah. I've got to take a step back. I have a, I have a follow-up question. You can adjust it to your flow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a follow-up. I have a follow-up for you, Ben, and then you can, you know, pass the ball around the, swing it around I'm the horn, if you will. I'm used to playing point guard. I apologize. Um, <laughs> so, so your, like, lizard brain at 39-33 picked up on something. 39-23, yeah. That you just, 39-23. Were we down 16? Shivers, I didn't see the first half. Anyway. We were uh, down 21. <laughs> uh, um, I mm-hmm. know we were down 21. I saw that. But, um, but you, so your lizard brain picked up on stuff, and it wasn't just the score. What, what were, you know, if you kind of, like, I guess reverse rationalize what your instincts were picking up, what do you think it was? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, it just seemed like the team was lackluster, uh, from all angles. I think we had something like 22 turnovers in this particular game. Uh, and it seemed like everyone's passing and flow and synchronicity was completely off. Uh, like even Al Horford threw the ball away a couple of times, which is just completely out of character for him. Uh, it, it, lack of synchronicity on, on both ends, really defensively and offensively. Um, and then when we saw that Paul George was out for this game, my immediate worry was, okay, well, like, of course, the tenacity or lack thereof in this case of the team is going to adjust to that reality, and it did, and they played down to their opponent. And then we see guys like BJ Boston just, like, completely shitting all over us and having a career game and us letting him do it. And, um, yeah, it was just a, a lack of a lack of effort all around, which I feel like a broken record saying that about this team at this point. Uh, but it was clear. I don't know. What did you think? Well, Jackson, you're cute. Jackson, what did you think, oh, mate? Thank, thank you, host. Um, I think I tapped out mentally about, I don't know, eight mm. times in this game. <laughs> it was just, it's really like my second 
my my second least favorite kind of game besides like getting blown out by 50 and you've star player getting injured and just like a miserable experience wire to wire that's number one number two is when the game sort of idles you're behind by like nine points or thereabouts you get it back to six jumps to 12 you get it back to seven it jumps to 15 and it stays like that all game but the cherry on top is the it gets thrown around the, the reddit a lot these days the, the fake comeback i'm thinking of it as the, the because like, balls comeback <laughs> Yeah, it, precisely. It was such a tease because even when I think we were down 15 with about five minutes to go in the fourth and we ended up getting back to one. And I just, we've mentioned this so many times before, but you go back to the 17, 18 Celtics, those games we win in our sleep. Like the, the all hope is gone. We just hit our last few shots. We close them out and everything's rosy. And it's like, oh my God, I can't believe we did that. We've got to stop getting in these holes. It's getting so frustrating. Um, but this time we just don't win those games. So to just keep coming back and keep looking like you're going to do something and then painfully and predictably not being able to capitalize on it. Um, yeah, it, it sucks. But like, I mean, it, I kept, I kept like walking away and coming back and thinking, Oh man, like this, this could be the, the we might be able to do it. But like deep, deep down, I was, I would, I probably mentally tapped out about like for real, like deep down, like inside, I knew what we weren't going to win this game probably around about half time when the guy named Boston is destroying us, it's like, oh, the jokes just, are just going to write themselves here. So, yeah. Um, what what kind yeah, of like mystical sucked. cosmic BS is that when a guy named Boston just lights us up yeah. like that? I just, doesn't that seem more than a coincidence? Like it's, it feels like a sort of a karmic wave or force or something? What do you think, Joe? Yeah. Well, look, we haven't uttered these words for a little while. Uh-oh. But does it need to be said? The curse. Ooh. The curse of IT. Mm. Do we need to get... I mean, is this... Do we need to get Dr. <laughs> Charles Ulysses Nesbitt Thought back on the, <laughs> on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Yeah, yeah. Scholar. <laughs> Look... It it's this seems to be um you know a manifestation of that particular phenomena, mm. does it not? It certainly you know? does. And and when you think about it, I didn't see this. I was listening to this on a drive to a client meeting, so obviously I was focused. Um, half time, just before half time, what happened? It was like a, a turnaround buzzer three, beating three no from about scope. well well beyond the arc. Yeah, with like you know competent defensive coverage and i think that way he was like six for seven from three or no four from the field at least at that stage so i was like oh yeah cool it's, it's gonna be one of those games where just suddenly some guy just shows up and is just like dynamite against us and just like yeah the added the added bonus of being named after the the team or the city that you support maybe like brad needs to look into a, a drafting uh hierarchy or, or criteria where we start getting guys named <laughs> phoenix and Miami and Milwaukee, if they're if they're out there, like that would probably be, you know, we're, we need some we need some kind of something to combat this against. Maybe that's the way to break do the curse. Trade, to start do we naming. trade Tatum for Boston? Is that the answer? Is it just about getting our namesake on the team? Is it whatever sure. it takes to break yeah. the, the curse at this point? Yes. Well, do, okay. But hands on hearts, boys. Did you allow yourselves to believe? Again? Of course, always. That's yeah. maybe the worst part, right? Is like, yeah, I said that I tapped out in the second quarter, but they cut it to what one point, and there's always that sense of like, well, you know, they're missing Paul George. Surely we're destined to win this game. I mean, come on, that that's where we're all at, right? Where like that's why you keep watching after mm. those those bullshit second quarters, um, and then even though it's almost like the definition of insanity, right? And we all are guilty of this as fans where you still every time for some reason think, you know, surely not again, surely this time we're going to win the game. And uh, unfortunately with these Celtics, and it's this is over a few years now, maybe it's due to the curse, but it always seems to end up the same way. We don't we don't win those games. What do you think the the recipe for that is, Joe? Like why why are we repeatedly ending up in these situations? Um, this is, I don't know if this quite qualifies as an answer, but like the difference between being down by 10, um, and like, <laughs> I think of as orbiting, um, Jackson's turn was idling. They're kind of both kind of similar, yeah. but like if you're orbiting around a five point lead or a five point deficit, 
um, that's something that's that doesn't take much of a counter punch. But when you're orbiting around like a 15 point deficit, it just requires a massive, massive counter punch. Um, and you you know it's this is one of those. It's almost like a Yogi Bearism, but you can't complete a comeback if you don't take the lead. You know, like it doesn't count. Like you, you never. It's like if you take the lead and lose it, you. I always feel like you could get it back. So I I really felt like it was actually lost at the end of the third quarter where we really had them, we really had them on their heels, um, and then we just gave up like. We gave up like it was an eight point effective run and we were down by, we cut it to four and then we were all of a sudden we were down by what, 12, 11 going into the, going into the fourth yeah. quarter. Um, and that's just, that's all that is, is if you're trying to cut back from a 10 point deficit to do that, you know, then you might've taken a five point lead and then it goes back to a three point deficit. That's a very different, like mentally, you, you don't have the same pressure on you. Um, like, you know what it's like when you're playing, you feel like you've got to make it all up, right? Um, and I just think I think we just feel the scoreboard pressure really keenly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, t- just too much, just too much of a hold. Like five points too big. Jackson, I uh, I didn't let you answer before. Did you Did you have a point where you believed again, sort of later in this game? I mean, I was doing these ones like, oh, yeah. come on, like when we would when we got it back. But like, um, I think it was Marcus Morris Senior who hit a three. To push to it back up to like yeah, six, yeah, was a and I was so 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 sure beyond any reasonable doubt, I would have bet all three of our lives, like no problem yeah. at all, that that <laughs> shot was going in. Because I'm like, this is this is what the game is doing. We're, we're like, we get it back. Oh no, not quite. Oh no, not quite. And then that was the moment. I was like, if that if this three rims out and we put it on the other end, I think we could have something here. But lo and behold, it went in. And even when Reggie Jackson missed that that free throw, and we got the Al Horford flinch, I was like, "This is this has got the makings of a really classic Celtics win." And I was just like, "No, nah, it's it's not it's not going to happen." So the, the 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 eternal optimist child supporter in you is always going to believe they can win, even when you're down like thirty or whatnot. But um, like realistically, I just couldn't I couldn't silence the this is. This is this is just like every other game or almost every other game I've seen before this season where we're going to be just about there and it's just not going to happen. So I don't know if that qualifies or not, but you know I was I I did not really believe as much as I used to. Which now that I say that out loud is actually quite frightening, to be honest. I know it's in the context of a season. I'm not going to giving up for like you know, forever or whatnot, but I always had yeah. This time this season feels different this feels like a mm, no it's just not gonna happen this time yeah so that's a bit of a meta question so we're probably i mean we already talked about it a bit but like where are you at on your expectations what what, what's your expectation for the season going forward boys it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a 500 season i think i was i'm still very much like of the of the opinion that this is this is symptomatic of a first year coach you know, this is this is, he is still very much working this out, and like there are key like key things that he has to figure out, and he has to manage the team to get this going here. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Anyone thinking that a doke has got to go just needs to like pump the brakes a little bit. You know, this is a learning process as much as anything. But I mean, I, I still maintain that there's some hope that like I think as long as you go into the last into as long as you go into the playoffs in good form, if we if we suck, I mean, if we really suck for the rest of the year and then win nine out of the 10 final games, I'll give us any chance of doing, of, of making noise in the playoffs. But the chances of that happening, the more and more the season goes on, the the less and less I think it's likely. So I think like, I don't know, if you, if you need like a tangible sort of answer, I, I'd put us in the play-in. I still think we're good enough to be in the play-in. I just think that's probably as as good as we can, we can, we can get, you know, first round. Don't think so. Yeah. I, ben, uh, what do you think? I still have, some hope and that might just be like a flaw in my character but i uh i just think that you know i just care too much we, we've got a bit of a tough <laughs> schedule coming up which we'll get to at the back end of this podcast uh if joe the host uh allows it but <laughs> we uh staying alone we're, then. yeah we're hovering around 500 right and like we kind of just need a stretch of like winning eight out of ten or something which i think we are capable of because we've seen We've seen good stretches, um, but there's just been some absences, some pretty crucial absences. You know, Time Lord, uh, Jalen Brown, uh, most uh, importantly. And I just think we're capable of a sort of a 
a good stretch of season that sort of because the pack is so tight from like seed three to nine or whatever it is mm. that we don't have to really overachieve to separate ourselves from that pack and kind of comfortably fit into like an above playing spot. And I, it's pretty early still as enough sample size to have like a preliminary sense of panic, but we've seen enough good enough promise to for people like me, I suppose to still feel like we can chunk together a, a big enough stretch of, of that kind of performance to, to separate us from that middle pack. So that's kind of what I fall asleep thinking every night. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't know. That's I just feel like, you know, like Tatum, for example, has kind of de-slump, de-slumpified himself again, I believe is the technical term. Uh, and I'm kind of back back on the Tatum camp a little bit. I feel like he's had some really impressive play. Uh, there was a one play in particular against the Lakers. Uh, you know, admittedly, I think he was being defended by... Not Wesley Matthews. He doesn't play for the Lakers anymore, but um, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but he's the Wesley Matthews archetype. Uh, he was defending <laughs> Tatum and he like kind of got him down to the free throw line and then like sort of faked like it was spinning out and then pivoted back into the paint and got like an open layup. And it was such an athletic, smart move and all the moves, all the plays that he'd made up until that point set him up to be able to to give that fake and make that play. And he's shown us a lot of really sort of heady high IQ plays recently. I don't know. I kind of feel like he's back. And I also feel like he's like, hasn't hit his ceiling yet. I don't know if I'm, I'm completely out of my mind getting there, but I'm like suddenly like completely back in on Tatum. And that gives me a lot of hope uh, about what not necessarily this season could be, but what future seasons could be. And it's sort of his age, 24, 25, 26. Hopefully if he doesn't leave him, sign with the Lakers. Um, I, just, I feel like there's still a lot of promise there. So, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not as bummed out as maybe the majority of the fan base is. What do you think, Joe? I'll let Jackson go. I've got a follow-up question. Okay. And then and then, um, and then Ben did actually put together a little run. I've got to so get to some of these Reddit yeah. shout-outs in a second. But we'll, let's, let's get to Jackson first. <laughs> Real quick, I think like we're seeing what we normally see from him in the last two or three years, a slow start. And then he starts to get it together, like once the season's up and running. So yeah, I'm still definitely all in on Tatum. I love the play today where Schroeder hesitated on a three, bricked it, Jackson got the rebound, and then Tatum just stripped it right, right back off him, and then like laid it in. I can't remember it was if it was an and one or not, but I just remember thinking to myself, I remember like you know the Leonardo DiCaprio once upon a yeah. time in Hollywood meme was doing <laughs> yeah. that, like yeah, I did that. Yeah, I was I was stoked on that. So yeah, I'm not worried about Tatum in the slightest. I'm worried about the team that fits around him. And, um, yeah, that's probably the, the shortest answer I can give on that. But I'm not, I'm not concerned. So I, I just – what I found myself thinking is, like, we're definitely going to play better. Definitely, definitely, definitely. But it just I just kind of settled on, like, we're just not a relevant team. So my follow-up mm. question was, am I right? Are we, am I right or wrong? Are we relevant? Hmm. Um, ben, are you going to answer this one? Sorry, you, you go first this time. I feel like I've been I've been sure. Dennis Schroeder ball hogging so far. Yeah. <laughs> if I if I think about if I think about how I've felt about top five hundred teams every other year, because you know um, they, we've been lucky enough not to be one by last year. Yeah, I don't think about them. I don't I don't think about them at all. It's only when they go on some absurd like 10, 11 game run and they like you know catapult themselves out of um, you know the seventh, eighth seed. You're like, oh, hang on a second, you've seen this team's coming together, but. I mean, we're not making enough noise and we're not making doing enough positive, you know, things like winning consistently to, 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 to justify being, you know, a quote unquote relevant team. So I would probably say no at this point. Um, and that's probably, if that's the definition we're going to run with, it's probably how we're going to remain for the rest of the season. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly right now in the present moment, we're not relevant league-wide. Where we're relevant is with what we're poised to do in that we have these two all-star and then in one case, borderline superstar player, you know, both under 25 years of age and with some legitimate pieces under those guys in smart and time Lord and even like Grant Williams and Romeo Langford and Josh Richardson, mm -hmm. who's been great, like whether or not they're part of the ultimate team or part of trades that form the ultimate team were relevant in that we've, we're sort of poised to do something with that. Like who would it be? Um, I, I suppose there are some 
pretty incompetent front offices that you know would probably fumble that bag. But uh, I don't feel necessarily like we're in in that category. And then you know compare that to you know we played the Lakers yesterday, and they're similar, um, led by two, you know, superstars, all stars, whatever you want to call it. But they have traded away all of their assets to get to that point. They've got no really immediate picks on the horizon. LeBron James is 37. That like that ship will sail eventually, right? Like Father Time always wins. Anthony Davis is the goat of like hitting the floor or whatever that stat is. Like he's injury prone. He's always on the floor. Like he's inconsistent in his availability. Shout out, shout out, Bill yeah. Simmons and uh, of Ron course, yeah, 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 the goat <laughs> podcasters, <laughs> pod father and son. Uh, and <laughs> so it's it's interesting in like the construction of those teams are. Uh, similar and while you know the Lakers won in 2020 and have more star power now in their top two we're poised to make more noise in in the future and I I feel like we're always relevant and worthy of league-wide attention because of that does that make sense Joe I think um you can say no (laughs) our answers to that question uh, what no makes sense because I've been podcasting with you for like almost four years now and um at this point, I know how your fandom kind of is built. <laughs> Taints my logic. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and I, look, look, I think you see this. I think you you see the sunny side. Um, I think the way in which we're going to be relevant is like we. I don't think we are relevant, and I think that's a problem. And um, the, well, I, one of the maybe unexpressed reasons why I was like thinking, hey, we need to like. We need to look at making a major move last off season is because I just feel like the vultures are going to start circling. If this team is a 500 team at the end of the year, like there will be changes made and we won't be dealing from a position of strength. Yep. Like even the last off season, mm-hmm. like we, we, we kind of, we, we would still be able to deal from somewhat of a position of strength, right? Especially with regards to the Jays. That'll change. You know, because after this season, I think Jalen might only have two years, one left. No, two left. Yeah, yeah, two left. He'd have to have two, because he'd be year seven, wouldn't he? In twenty twenty three. No, he'd have. No, no, he'd be one year after this season. He's twenty sixteen. You get seven years. Yeah, do you do you do three years and a four year extension that takes you through to twenty twenty three. Like we're on the clock. <laughs> we're on the clock, guys. Mm. And um and it's it's not great. I should just check that that, that I've got that right because if yeah. I was another Celtics fan and I was listening to me get this wrong, I'd be like, Ugh, he, yeah, he, he, his extension guy? was the was the bubble year, was yeah. the COVID he was an year. unrestricted free agent in twenty twenty four, apparently twenty three. Okay, well I will take you. Yeah. So we've got two years. Yeah. We've got yeah. two years. But but the, the point the point isn't as strong, but it does still still stand. Um, you know. Um, we've seen Anthony Davis put on pressure to leave, and he's not Anthony Davis, but Anthony Davis is putting the pressure on from with, with two years to go. Yep. So um, I guess it, it makes... Um, yeah. th- there's just no safe place in the NBA, right? There's no safe strategy. You've always got to be looking to take a risk, and you've you've got... Man, you've got to know before. You've got to know your own players and what they're capable mm-hmm. of. You know, yeah. um, and and I, I don't really want to get into into my my takes on that because I think they're pretty well documented. But um, yeah, I like I just I think the team's going to be broken up sooner or later. yeah. Well, <laughs> probably later, mm. probably later. But if it's going to be broken up later, you've got to think well. You know, yeah. Should we do it sooner? But anyway, that's uh, that's that's enough of that. Ben, you have. If you want to make some more comments, go for it. But otherwise, I'll hand the running of this podcast over. Well, we have a a Reddit recap coming up in a sec, and there's something to that effect where we can talk about like kind of what the next move is, or you know, if we should stand pat or whatever it is. I I just really quickly Celtics Reddit. You know, we post our podcast to their sub; they're very accommodating. We love the people of Celtics Reddit, and a couple of comments on the game very quickly. Firstly, from I am the real I am the real Lang Lounge. I don't know. They say, go down big, claw their way back, come up short. I've seen this game a thousand times, which is to say everything that we've already said, that this is just a formula. There's been coaching changes. There's been some personnel changes, everything but the core, really, with Smart and the Jays. And we continue to see 
this sort of habitual approach or lack thereof to the game, which is uh, very, very disappointing. Uh, and I want to end sort of the game discussion on, on this comment from, uh, this is a post by user Red Cigar. They said the Celtics are 30th in defensive rating and second in offensive rating and 12th in net rating in the three West Coast road trip games so far. In 15 games before those games, second in defensive rating, 24th in offensive rating, and sixth in net rating. We need to focus on defense first as the primary goal, which is what Red Cigar says. So a total inversion of our offensive slash defensive net ratings there, which um, probably just speaks to the overall inconsistency of the team. Well, at the risk of repeating myself, I just think this is Adoka figuring it out for the first time. I think that at the start of the season, the offense was garbage and the defense was was fine. Then it seems to have flipped. So obviously, we're capable of doing both, but just not at the same time. So that's on as much as the coach as it is the players, I think, to, to strike that balance. And, you know... I, I couldn't give a toss if if all the games are like the Blazers game. If we if we give up 125 points but score 145, I'll take that every single day of the week. Conversely, if we if it's like the Sixers game and we win like two points and it's 89 to 87, no worries at all. I don't care how we how, how the victories come, whether we're an offensive identity or a defensive identity. Um, I think defense is probably a bit more reliable. You're not relying on shots, or you're not subject to like you know bullshit like we saw against like the Jazz, where just like shots just fall in from anywhere. But I think this is just this is them trying to figure it out. And I think if we are going to be a defensive identity team, then sure, you know, you know, focus on that for the most part. But that will get real old real soon. We're like, why aren't we scoring more points? This is just. This is what's going to happen. And I think Udoka's, you know, I think I, I'll bet you that's what he's trying to do every single day is get the balance correct. And it just obviously isn't happening at yeah. the moment. Yeah. And when you're dealing with a bunch yeah. of like sub 25 year olds as well, that must be, it's almost like the, the yeah. NBA coaching equivalent of teaching kindergarten. Um, sorry, Joe, you, you wanted to add something there? <laughs> well, yeah, I think that we don't have a path to relevance other than by playing, by winning ugly. Like we we need to have low scoring games. We really do. It's just that scoreboard pressure just builds on us so much when it's when it's a slightly high scoring game. And um, mm. yeah, we've just got to stay within ten, all at all times. Um, I just yeah, and and typically that's that's making a lower score game. Lower scoring game just means that you can kind of ride out Tatum's um, variance a little bit. Um, mm. You know, if he's a high variance offensive player, you just need to give yourself more chances and you give yourself more chances if you're stopping the other team from scoring. Yeah, I'm curious to hear, Jackson, starting with you, how much weight you think this point has on the season so far. So NBC Sports Boston posted a short clip today of Chris Forsberg, old mate, friend of the show, interviewing Danny Ainge. And in the interview, Ainge likened this year to last year in the sense that the injury report includes key players every night. We mentioned Jalen Brown, Robert Williams, uh, most notably... Does that feel like a legitimate excuse to you? It doesn't feel like one because it's like we'd be naive to think that like it's it's unique to us. You know, this affects every single team. You know, I think like the successful teams are the ones that 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 stay healthy. And I think you know, yeah, you should probably like die. You could dive in and be like, oh, you know, Phoenix have you know this new this team of nutritionists and this like very like precise and strict regimented training regime. There might be elements to that as well too. But like every team is missing players through stretches throughout the season you know it comes down to you know the character and the coaching staff and all the other players to to sort of you know cover that up and last year I think was last year was probably far worse um it, obviously we only got like you know almost half of a season of a sample size here it could be much worse going forward we'll see but I think like other than you know missing uh you know Brown for this extended period of time and missing Williams for a bit it's like it hasn't been anything that isn't been typical last season we had how many players did we have out for COVID like at multiple times and then amongst and Kemba's knees you know we had to like you know sort of rely on that to a degree so it, it's similar in, in in the respect that you know sure there are absences but it doesn't feel like a legitimate excuse to me I feel like you know there should be enough there I feel like we're a deeper team this year than we were last year so we should be able to at least you know offset that at least somewhat I think did it look any different when we have had the guys? You know, because we have had the guys for a few games. Did it really look any different? Yeah, I mean, not mm. not really. It's just more like what I hang on to is we haven't had them all for that long, really. Um, and there's a lot of talk, and, and Joe, maybe you can expand on this, but about how the Jays can't play together. But, like, 
part of that surely is like they're just not playing together. How can they be expected to figure it out when they just, at least within this iteration of the team, they haven't really had that much on court time together? I mean, but you know, what do they say? The best ability is availability. availability. Yeah, props availability, to Tatum in that sense right? as well. It's a, it's mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and at some point, like at some point, when's Jalen Brown considered a bit injury prone? You yeah. know, at some point, is that just him? You know, and and you've just kind of got to bank on him being missing a couple of decent stretches a year. You know. Yeah, I think this is a good time to segue here. So starting with a comment from user Scal Lucifer, they say, let's face it, we are not going to, quote, figure it out. Right now we are just waiting for a trade to happen uh, or for the off season." which made me think, I don't know why this made me think this, uh, and I've answered this, so I'm going to throw to you guys. Jackson, we'll start with you. What are your happy Celtics thoughts that keep you grounded and optimistic in in times like this like what do you what do you fall back on it's like well at least this is the case so, so we're, not doing, we're not doing the dirty ones we're doing the clean ones that's we're doing right. the happy ones complete 180 yeah <laughs> yeah um i think honestly just we probably only are one trade away from being a far different team what tra- what trade is that i don't know to be perfectly honest but i feel like there's 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 a there's a well of untapped potential that is there and we've seen it bubbling up we've seen what tatum is capable of we've seen what brown is capable of but yeah they haven't shown enough to me that they can play together and i know they haven't had like you know a lot of consistent game time this year but like let's face it they've both been in the same team since 2017 you know so or 18 whatever but it's been it's been a while that they've been playing together so you think they would have probably figured something out by now um you know I was kind of hoping that maybe Schroeder in a weird way would be like, would be that guy, like just the, 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 the past first guard, you know, if you want to call him that, but um, I still think we're only one trade away. And I think like that the talent that we have is still something to be reckoned with, even if we're not necessarily relevant at the moment. So I still honestly believe that there is a team in there that can do business, you know, and I think the timeline of the, that we have as well too, probably suits. Um, I still think we're probably four or five years away from seeing Brown and Tatum at their best. Whether or not they're on the, t- the same team at that stage or both on the team at the same stage, I'm not whoa, too whoa, sure. Whoa. But happy I, 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 sorry, <laughs> happy, sorry, I, I, ve- I, veered, I veered into the darkness. You, you have to forgive me. I still, I still think, I still think those two are probably are, are most of what you need to be a relevant, competitive contender. I'm thinking a little more short term, Ben. I'm thinking. Um, in order to enjoy a season, you don't actually have to really think you're going to win the championship. It's not necessary at all. You just want something to latch onto. Like, how much fun did we have, like, the first IT season? Oh. You know, when... Um, mm. Well, the first two, really, you know? It's great fun. You know, all it takes is a little bit of an identity. It's all you need as a fan, and you're in. And you can enjoy every game for itself. You know, and if you make the playoffs, you just enjoy that for itself. But it, it, like, it's you know, it's you, 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 winning a championship is just so unlikely. You know, you've got to find your joy from other things. And um, and I, I enjoy a team that has a distinct identity and plays. And and you know, we've fallen in love with those teams before, and it can happen again. And for me, like um, like I'm probably realize like I'm just Marcus Smart to like die, mm-hmm. man. Like, mm. you know, like I just love the guy. I love him. I don't want to trade him. You know why? Because cause that gives me something as a fan to latch onto. I can cheer for Marcus sure. Smart. Warts and all, man. He's my guy. You know? Sorry. And and I'm going to keep watching because I want Marcus Smart to do good. You know? I want the boys to do good. You know? And each game, it's like golf. You know, you're having a crap game of golf, which is most games for most of us. <laughs> but every time you tee up, right, like there's still a chance you might make par. <laughs> on this hole this, you know and you, you know you just got to each each hole is a game unto itself and each game in the NBA is a game unto itself and it can be enjoyed in isolation you ever play Wii Golf I'm the Tiger Woods of that shit honestly like pre pre car action <laughs> Tiger Woods Wii Golf every time I'm birdieing it's, uh, it's a real talent also in an incline sort of couch position as well I've mastered the like wrist flick perfect golf swing anyway I digress uh <laughs> Challenges, if you're out there, I'll play you in week off anytime and, and win. Uh, y- Maybe we just do that for a podcast. Just like walk yeah. in the fairways. With 
<laughs> the first ever live episode. We got to get uh, spoons and Jay on here and the wee Joe, golf. Uh, I think that's a really healthy mindset. As like as far as finding the right thing to latch onto and um, yeah, I already mentioned the sort of the things that I'm latching onto in, in talking about whether or not this team is relevant. So I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I do want to quickly shout out Romeo Langford. Not that I'm like solely latching myself onto the, the Romeo Langford experience, but he was good in this game. Uh, in the Clippers game, we saw him early and then not again really at all in the second half, which I thought was weird given how effective he was and just how solid he was in his decision making um, and how kind of uh, perfectly simple his game is. It's just kind of like he always sort of catches it in the corner or on the wing and it's always like a fake and a drive and it's usually either a clean finish or a clean pass off, whether it's a dump off or a kick out to the corner. It's just so beautifully simple and i just think this team is just like starving for that kind of approach from from its role players so uh i'm optimistic about about romeo langford as well as the jays like i mentioned uh earlier um we're going to transition now to the reddit recap and we sort of touched on some of this stuff earlier it's a post from user super sick x3 they say i just want to ask what the hell is this team's plan if the apparent beal plan falls through they go on to say it seems like Bradley Beal has been a target of the Celtics and they may have a chance to get him, but what the hell is going to happen if they don't? This team's future is extremely concerning at this point. And the post goes on a little bit longer. If you're watching the YouTube version, you can see it up on your screen now. Um, but suffice to say, Joe, like I think early before the season started, names like Zach Levine, Bradley Beal, it was kind of like, okay, we're poised to acquire one of these guys. Their respective teams are doing quite well now. We're obviously not. Doesn't seem like, you know, that's on the horizon anymore. So we've kind of talked about, well, may- no way. well maybe a move away. <laughs> like, what? where do we go from here? Yeah, well, Bradley Beal's not coming. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't feel, I don't feel like I'm sticking my neck out too much saying that. Um, look, if, we, if, we, if we're kind of just facing the reality of where we are as a team, we gain nothing giving Schroeder 30 minutes a night. Like, we, be, we maybe we'll be a 44-win team at the end of the day, but from a team-building perspective, you know what? I'm just, just get rid of him. I don't like watching him. I don't like watching him pump fake and pump fake and pump fake and then taking the hardest possible yep. free. Can't, I just don't like his game. He gives us stuff that makes us, on average, a bit better. But you know what? We're just another team with him. So let's get rid of him. Because he's just soaking up minutes, man. And and Richardson's been great, but um, like, man, we got to see what we've got with these yep. young guys. Because we'll be able to get value for Richardson and Schroeder. Mm. Let's get the value. See what we've got there, the young guys. They got nothing. Well, at least we know. And then we move on and start with yeah. the next crew. Um, I I just don't think that there's going to be a material difference, uh, to 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 this year. You know how it goes, and and as a fan, I want you. You always want the young guys, right? That's what gives you the optimism, right? Like it's always more fun to cheer for a really young team. And we've got this kind of hybrid thing now. Horford's a bit different. I think Horford's. Um, I'd be open to trading Horford, but I kind of like him, so I don't want to trade him. Look, I'm sure there's a plan B in case the B all trade doesn't work, which it won't. As 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 because they're just doing so much better than us, they've got no need to do that. Um, if anything, I think. Would probably like incre- uh, you know improve Richardson as a uh, as an asset you know probably Schroeder too but like you know whoever's getting him is only getting him for a certain amount you know six months maybe um, so look I think we've still got some moves that can be made but I mean it's it, it's there are so many variables that can happen just between now and the trade window or now and the end of the season um, so I, I I don't I, I don't find any comfort in sort of like sort of dwelling on that I think we should yeah see what we've got with our young guys definitely if that means shipping Schroeder off and getting you know a couple of second rounders or whatever and you know being a little bit more sure about whether you know Peyton Pritchard is someone who is you know a worthy backup point guard or whatnot um you know that's certainly worth exploring but I mean I'm pretty sure Brad Stevens takes this very seriously and he can see everything that we can see and more so I know for a fact that there's got to be something going on in the background. You know, there's a big whiteboard up there with like, you know, strings and everything going every, every single which direction. So I have faith that they know what they're doing. 
and that they have guys on their radar. And if it all doesn't materialize, then yeah, you just blow it up and you start again. Uh, and that would be horrible. But I, I, I love watching, I love watching this team. So I would go through another re, re, rebuild. It's no problem. Well, we just lost you for a second there, Jackson. But I think we, I think we, got, we got the, we got the point back. of it. Yeah. Uh, well, did you come back when I said blow it up because it's fun to watch another rebuild? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all going to come out in the wash, so it's, uh, it's fine. Um, yeah, the yeah. I think on the well, first of all, let me ask you guys this: What's the sort of minimum acceptable package back for Schroeder before the trade deadline? Say there's a contender that sees value in his contributions. Is it a first round pick? Given that a contender would, you know, probably have an outside of the lottery first round pick, or would we take it just a straight up second round pick for him at this point? Or like, what's what do you hope? Conditional, conditional. first, con- conditional sure. first. I think you know. Mm. Converting to two seconds, probably something like that. Yeah, and I think we take that yeah. unless we rip off twenty games straight and suddenly Tatum and Brown just play out of this world, and it's like, well, suddenly we could really use a guy like Dennis Schroeder in the playoff to support the the both uh, MVP candidates that we suddenly have on our team, uh, which is you know, let's be honest, not going to happen. Uh, yeah, Schroeder is an obvious move, and then as far as like getting someone like Beal or um, someone of that caliber, kind of feels like. The move is like two years from now, which we talked about Jalen Brown's contract. Like that's still sort of safe territory for us where maybe the the free agent class this upcoming year is pretty lackluster, but in a in a additional year's time, I'd have to peruse the list, but I think there's maybe more options there and flexibility was sort of the, the main theme heading into this season. And I, I think, you know, we might be in a position where, you know, worst case scenario, we can dump some salary and sign a, a free agent you know, in a season or two's time. Um, and that, I don't know, that actually folds back into the optimism discussion. It's like, well, we're, you know, we're not for now, mm. but, you know, we're poised to be something in the future and and attract a, a free agent in a couple of years' time. That sucks because most Celtics fans are like, well, we're the fucking Celtics. We've won 17 championships. Like, we're, we are entitled to another championship. And it's like... We've won one in our collective lifetime. You know, like we're not that. And in the 90s, our two best players I died. I did just sneak in. Once since I the internet. Once in since the, the internet. Oh, yeah. you got in there. Oh, well, I'm very jealous yeah, of you yeah, yeah. Um, getting to witness that. Um, <laughs> I, an eyewitness <laughs> recount, I'm sure. Um, but uh, since then, it's been pretty grim. <laughs> and uh, it's going to take a while to get back to that point. And we're not entitled to anything. We don't deserve anything. Um, and I think we need to be patient while we set ourselves up to pounce on whatever opportunities come up. And it just doesn't seem like it's going to be this year. So what is the plan? It's going to be, as Brad Stevens likes to say, hit singles, make some moves around the edges and remain poised to make the big move uh, should it present itself. Does that sound fair to you guys? Works for yeah. Me. The, like, <laughs> I feel like that's assuming that um, I, I don't know. Like I sort of, I sort of feel like we've got to have a hit from one of our young mm-hmm. players before anything matters. You Shout know? out Grant Williams. Um, we can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a he's the one. <laughs> and they've, all, they've actually all shown some mm-hmm. promise, right? Like I'm not really to, ready to write off. You know, I was not a Langford guy at all. But you know what? The guy's shown he's probably an NBA player. You know, I want to see it. Um, I I think I just I I think that's our path back. You you've got to get the momentum heading in the right direction again. That's that's just task one A. Eh? And um, because you don't want you don't want to be like you don't want to make like a lifeboat trade. Like oh, you know, like we are trying to salvage some contenderdom that really wasn't in our grasp anyway. Yeah. I don't want to see us do that. Yeah. Um, but shivers, I mean, I'm just going to contradict myself left, right, and center because, you know, you've got to keep conscious of the fact that as much as I'm, you know, Tatum and Brown, like you should, even though, like, I, you know, I've got my issues with both of them, shivers, I don't want either of them to leave for nothing. And, and hey, if we're on the clock, that becomes a risk. Mm-hmm. Look, Tatum looks fucking good, I think. And I think... We've still got some runway ahead of us to to play around with like what looks good around him. So uh for this uh Reddit user whose name I've closed the tab, sorry, I've forgotten your username, 
uh, I, I don't. We don't. Obviously, we don't have a specific answer for you. Um, but there are options. Um, and increasingly dwindling options. But like, there's no reason to lose all hope yet, just because we lost back-to-back games in Los Angeles. Um, finally, guys, let's end up on this. The upcoming schedule. I wish this was more of an optimistic finishing point. We've got the <laughs> Suns in Phoenix, the Phoenix Suns. Hmm. Um, then we go home and we play the Milwaukee Bucks, the Golden State Warriors, the Kemba Walker-less uh, New York Knicks, the Sixers, and the Cavs. All games we could very, 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 very easily lose. What do you guys see? We'll start with you, Jackson, with this upcoming stretch. How do you how do you sort of mentally navigate through this upcoming stretch? Uh, I think I said on the last episode, if we could be on in, on January first, if we're at five hundred, I'll be stoked. <laughs> and that's looking unlikely because I mean, what, who were the next three? Um, yeah, Phoenix, Milwaukee, and and the Warriors. Yeah, that's a five game mm-hmm. losing streak that we're staring down the barrel of, and that's like three games below five hundred. I mean, the Knicks are going to be no pushover. By any stretch of imagination, no Kemba Walker. That's 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 bad for us. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm my optimism is at the lowest now. I mean, obviously coming off a loss, it's always going to be versus a winner. Oh yes, yeah, so we're going to win the next at least the next two. Um, but I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if we got a jammy win over one of those teams um, just to shit the bed again in the other two. Um, but you know, it's realistically, it's probably going to be three losses, another three losses on the bounce, which makes it five. Yeah. So yeah, if we're 500 yeah. January, that's an accomplishment. So that's, you know, that's a little goal. <laughs> that's a little goal for I'm us. Saying. You know? Yeah. Come on boys. Come on, yeah. Well, look, I, I can't add to that. I think you guys have hit the nail on the head there. It's, uh, I mean, if you could have told me at the beginning of the season that it would be an achievement to be 500 by January, I probably would have, cried um but now it's just the reality that we're in joe you've been our host for the majority of this podcast do you want to see us out of this one well ben i think that'll about do it for this podcast uh uh far out what's your little your little your little sign off there go celtics peace yeah. all right see you guys <laughs> hey for real though spoonie and jay are going to be back a little later in the week maybe <laughs> early next week um but until then like joe said go celtics peace